Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. What are we doing today? Good. Good. What have been your, your favorite session so far this, this weekend? <laughs> Which ones? Oh, and what was that session? Hidden gems. Hidden gems, excellent. What was the best gem? Excellent. Um, what were some of the things that blew your mind? Anything that, that really stretched you yet? I remember the first couple of Ruby conferences, and there was always something that. So last year, do you guys remember the um, the talk about um, how to hack any system with a with a Ruby exploit? Yeah. That was a bizarre talk. You know, I, I, I felt like I had to take a shower after that one, right? Um, is he still alive? So I'm, I'm going to do, yeah, is he still alive? I don't know. Um, hack the CIA site or something, right? Um, I'm going to spend some time today um, talking from a different perspective. Um, I haven't been on the speaker circuit for about two years. Instead, I've been spending some time writing for a company that builds nonprofit software. So the idea is that we take an important social problem and we try to find a way to make money solving it. So last year we worked on a system called Changing the Present. The idea is that there's um, six billion dollars or so that we spend on gifts and a lot of them are bad gifts, right? Like um, I heard somebody coming back from Java One, he said, um, gosh, I got another backpack because you can only give your dog one, right? And um, so I'm sure that those things are stacking up and, um, you know, we can only have so many ballpoint pens or fuzzy slippers. And the idea behind changing the present is that you can say, um, give your wife a donation gift. So an hour of a cancer researcher's time or something like that. Um, so we send, sent a web service request to a just-in-time printer and print a reading card and you give a donation to Habitat for, for Humanity or any um, nonprofit that's important to you. So that was last year. This year we're working on teachers. Um, the typical teacher will come out of pocket for somewhere between two and four thousand dollars per year for supplies that her budget doesn't cover. So, um, for, so this application will let you build like a wish list um, from a bunch of vendors on the web, and we'll take a chunk of the affiliate fee to actually maintain the servers so that, um, so that teachers can ask um, parents and other people in the community to give, right? So this has taken a lot of time and I haven't been spending as much time doing the writing and speaking kinds of things, but I thought that maybe today I could give you a little bit of a different perspective, a perspective of a Ruby user, because I'm really nothing but a user right now. And um, along the way, we'll try to give away a couple of um, my most recent book. And Dave's going to help me pick one of the best um, questions that you guys come up with throughout the talk to kind of keep it interactive. And I'll pick another one. So we'll give a couple of these away. But um, I'm also working on a revision of Rails Up and Running. Um, I did another book with, um, with Dave's company, The Pragmatic Press, from Java to Ruby a couple of years back. So, um, but recently, I've just been. I'm spending my time coding. So what I'd like to do today is talk about a number of themes of the talk and sort of the underlying, the undercurrents of the talk, if you will. And then we'll spend some time on some, some frameworks that are, I don't know, that, that have some conventional wisdom. And maybe I'll take you against the grain in some ways. Um, keeping in mind some of those some of those themes, and then we'll talk about some quick hitters, um, just some one-word thoughts that um, that can can tell you what I'm thinking um, and what Ruby is doing for me. So the first question I'd like you to be thinking about is how do you see yourself? What do you aspire to be? I often start a lot of these conferences. Um, or signed up with a bio, um, even on my books, that says I'm a, I'm a kayaker, a mountain biker, and a father of two, right? Those are the things that, that kind of stamp who, or the way that I see myself, my ego, my identity. And I think a lot of us can identify with the idea of us being, you know, 
mavericks, if you will, um, of, of us being a little bit different, aggressive. The idea of, um, I don't know, taking the industry in places where most people are kind of afraid to go. And there's an element of interest, an element of fun. How many people picked up Ruby in the first place because it was just a lot more fun than what you used before? Yeah. That's a whole lot like what I feel on the kayak. The other thing that I like is that I am the captain of my own ship. I can point that thing wherever I want it to go. Um, and whether it's, it's, a, it's a bad decision or a good one, I can be right or die trying, right? Um, and I think a lot of us are like that. But when you get a whole lot of mavericks, you kind of get this, this, weird, this, this weird vibe, right? So a whole lot of independence that found the same thing, and you have a whole lot of these loners together in a community, and it can turn into something else, right? What is that thing? Anybody know? That's a lemming, right? <laughs> So what happens when a bunch of mavericks get together and maybe one builds this great round peg and a bunch of us come follow along behind with these great square holes and we try to cram them together, right? What happens when the opinions underneath opinionated software suck, right? What do we do? What do we aspire to be? Are we the Mavericks or are we the Lemmings? In some ways, they're one and the same. There's this necessary tension between the energy that you get when you try new and different things and going along with the crowd, right? So I love this, this description in Wikipedia. It's kind of paraphrased. Um, but the idea is that, that Lemmings aren't really stupid. It's just that when that, that they reproduce a lot. And when there's an, an urge to migrate, basically for the species, they can find themselves in some scary places, like on the edge of a cliff overlooking the ocean. And when the urge to migrate gets strong enough, they jump. And I love this, this description. They jump off the cliff and start swimming, sometimes to exhaustion and death. Uh, that's pretty interesting, right? And so the undercurrent between the lemming and the maverick, who do we aspire to be? The second question that I have is what motivates you? Is it beauty? In fact, a whole lot of people at this conference are the people who lent beauty to our everyday lives and code, right? This, this evening, I hope to get to meet Matt who, who made this, this language with, with the foresight that we can actually build a language with a language that can look any way that we want to. And I'll talk a little bit later about the idea that our code should tell a story, and when the code loses the story, it's dead. What motivates you? Is it beauty? Is it the inherent simplicity? Or is it something else? You know, money is not a bad motivation. In fact, when you're coding for a living, these two slides are actually in precisely the wrong order. And that's a hard thing for a maverick to hear, that the idea that beauty is sometimes secondary. Sometimes beauty and money are one and the same, right? Like the idea of Ruby on Rails that the, that the configuration goes away and I can see the story in the code. That's a beautiful thing. Sometimes adopting the beauty can cost me, and it can cost me large. Right? Does that make sense? Has anybody been in that situation in the last couple of years a little bit more than you've wanted to be in that situation for adopting um, aggressive frameworks? Right? Do I adopt this cool new testing framework that lets me tell the story and stop the business world for three months while I poured all of my test code, right? Is the old stuff good enough? So the idea here is that um, 
is that money should be the overriding motivator and beauty should help you get there. Beauty should give you things like happy programmers that should let your code, code tell a story. And um, so that's, that's the second question, what motivates you? The third question is who is the beholder? So what's this? A dung beetle, everybody in Texas knows that, right? If I, if I flipped the lemming and the dung beetle in Norway, none of them would know what this is. And they wouldn't know why we Texans get into dung beetles, right? It's, it's taking waste and it's feeding the earth. It's actually an incredible thing. But when you're looking at that pile of crap, that thing is alternately beautiful or ugly depending on who's looking at it. And we in this community don't look hard and long enough at the pile to understand what we're looking at. And it cuts both ways. So these are the themes that I want to talk about. One, who do we aspire to be? That tension between the maverick and the lemming. And the idea that sometimes the lemming should win out, the community should win out, and sometimes the maverick should win out, right? The second idea is what motivates you, and the idea that when I'm coding for a living, money should be the motiv motivator, and beauty should be one of the things that helps me get there. And the third question is who's the beholder? Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on a couple of major Rails frameworks. These are in some cases, framework innovations. In some cases, these are thought innovations that we've seen in the last year or two. Um, the first one is REST and what that's, what that's doing to Rails. The second one is testing. And then there are a couple of quick ending themes that we'll talk about along the way. But let's start with REST. So um, a show of hands, how many of you have really liked the, the new direction of REST and Rails? How many of you really don't? Okay, that's probably pretty consistent with, um, with what we'd see. The conventional wisdom is that rails ro or rust rocks, so lots of rust has to rock harder, right? And you know, in a lot of ways, I agree. We get a whole lot of behavior for free, right? We write very little code to get, um, to get all of these incredible routes. I mean, if, if I had to type controller equal greater than something, action greater than equal something, um, one more time, I think it was going to puke, right? But the, the RESTful APIs let me really distill some ideas. And the conventional wisdom is free. And I'm here to argue that you know maybe the first hit's free, right? <laughs> and that there's an underlying cost. Now, I'm not here to tell you that rest on Rails sucks, right? Especially with all those hands that went up. You know, in fact, I'm about to pull all these slides all together, right? But um, I, am to, I am here to tell you that there is an associated cost. But first, let's look at the impacts on our code. This first line must be the most brilliant line of code that I've ever seen. I mean, instead of controller, users, action, update, ID, um, user.id, I get an automatic, how many routes does this generate? Somebody says seven, somebody says eight. Who, uh, who says four? Fourteen. Fourteen? <laughs> um, anybody, can anybody name them? What's that? What do you mean by routes? How many, so, so map resources is going to generate some named routes, right? Yeah. You hear this, you hear this rolling conversation, right? So, so that's, that's a good thing. That means that the code is alive, um, but it's the eye of the beholder, right? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and it lets us to do some beautiful things like this. It saves us lots of typing. And it also builds in some additional meaning into the typical HTTP verbs that weren't meaningful before, right? So instead of having the, um, the gets and posts and have the, the posts like overloaded to mean inserts and updates and deletes, well, we use all four restful HTTP verbs. A get does what? 
does, does a show, does a read, a put does what? And a, a, a post does what? And delete does, I mean, we can all chant this, right? Everybody can, you know, for now from the time that that little five-year-old Rails developers grew up, they're gonna be able to say, you know, just like their ABCs, right? Uh, there's a, a get, but anyway, the impacts, one of the impacts is that we're now taking the single purpose controller and we're flipping that to a multiple purpose controller. So that for a very tiny bit of additional code, we're getting an incredible amount of functionality. So what does this do? It allows you to multiple formats from one box. Yeah, one controller, multiple formats, whatever formats I want. The typical ones are HTML and XML um, and also um, JavaScript for our Ajax, right? And it lets us refine our user interfaces to a standard format. These are all great things, right? But I don't, so what we have is a lot of happy, restful goodness. We have a standardized way of looking at, um, of looking at models, controllers, we have this new concept called resources. We have a standard set of routes. We have less typing and a whole lot of places, right? How many of you have, um, have talked to a new Rails developer about REST? So how did that conversation go? <laughs> Boy, how many, how many people had a, had a great e e experience with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I've, I've had some of the same experiences. Um, actually, I've just had to revise a book that went from the, um, the initial version, the 1.0 version of Rails, to the 2.1 version of Rails. And, um, you know, the, the author, at the same time, the, author, the, um, the publishing company was working through their templating system, and um, that was awful. Um, but, um, so it was just, it was a very difficult um, situation. Is Lance here? So Lance, uh, um, how did you feel when you were trying to organize the book? Right, right. It, it's that, so we had, the, the problem is that we had to introduce so much to the user, like right off the bat, right? It's, it's instead of saying, okay, well these are the views, these are the controllers, these are the, the models, you can't go into that without teaching the user a whole lot of stuff, right? So I guess what I'm arguing is that rest has a cost. It has a cost. And we all agree. How many raised your hand when you said, when I said, do you like rest? How many raised your hand? Let's see them again. We've got to agree that it's at least sometimes worth it, right? It's the eye of the beholder again, right? So um, I think that one of the things that we're giving up, and this is a place that we've got to be careful. This is a place that the whole Rails community um, needs to consider the different perspectives. You know, am I the dung beetle or am I, um, am I somebody else, right? I've got to consider all of the different perspectives as I introduce things, especially things that are as central in the learning process um, as, as what, the scaffolding, right? How many of you learned Rails, or, or how many of you used scaffolding a lot when you were learning Rails? So this plays a huge role in the development of a new Rails programmer. Let's go back to that previous slide. This is what I used to show a Rails developer for a show method. This is what I show them now, right? This is what I used to show or this is what I show a new Rails developer for an update now. That's a lot to grab. A lot of Rails developers are also being introduced to Ruby for the first time. So one of the costs is that I'm introducing the concept of rest, right? 
put? I, I didn't know an HTTP put existed. I thought it was just post and get. Right? That's the way the rest of the world sees it until they've, they've um, you know, gone back and read the, the field's rest paper. And then there's the whole idea of the code block. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Oh, man. I love you, Dave. <laughs> so unplug my Kensington unit. Plug in Dave's. Uh, I hate you, Dave. Oh, man. OK. Oh, I love you again, Dave. OK. So, um, so the second thing is that we are introducing a lot of concepts to people that have learned Ruby for the first time. Now, code block is normally an easy, an easy construct to get, right? I'm just passing a block of code in. It's taking an argument back out. But how do you explain that in the context of responds to? That's a little bit difficult, right? So there's a little bit of black magic that we've got to get through. And again, this isn't insurmountable. This is just one more thing that's in, that's in the learning channel that we've got to attack. What is this path magic that's going on, right? What is this format magic that's going on? This is just a decision. But it's, it's, a difficult, it's in a difficult format for a new Ruby developer to encounter. And this is, this is also one of the things that's dangerous about this is that um, I am no longer able to see the story in the code. Yeah? Well, there's one simple thing you can do to fix that. Instead of saying respond to format, why don't you think respond to once? And then you can say once HTML, once XML, and then it's easy to explain to a new developer. Yep, yep, or, um, you know, the wants, the W A N T S. Yeah, I, I like that. I learned with that paradigm as well. Yeah. But you still have to teach, like, the, the whole paradigm of, you know, what that thing does. And it takes a code block, and the code block has a decision in it, right? right. It's, it's, there's some magic. And, I mean, do you remember the far side cartoon where, um, you know, a guy's writing on a whiteboard and he says, okay, you know, do this, then do this, then do this. And then do this, and then there's this thing that says, a little black magic occurs in here, right? And right, there's a big cloud. And, and those are the clouds that you're trying to eliminate. Yeah? I guess I'm not really sure I understand. The, the argument here is that the, the RESTful paradigm is, is not necessarily good because it's difficult for new Ruby developers to learn. I'm saying that one of the things that we have to consider when we make um, decisions like, do we replace the old scaffolding with the new scaffolding? Is how approachable does it make Ruby, right? And um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that REST is bad or the Rails implementation of REST is bad. I'm saying that in the eyes of the beholder, if we make too many decisions like this one, we're not going to be approachable anymore, right? Do you guys remember um, there was a, go ahead, Dave. Scaffolding is kind of like, you know, the entry drug for Rails is, is absolutely right. And the thing is that in both Rails 1 and Rails 2, scaffolding code is absolute crap. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're training an entire generation of Rails programmers to do it this way. And this way is incredibly bad. We don't understand how do you get there? Why, why are we even there? And I think that's the problem that people don't understand. Why do we do this? It's not boilerplate. But it's even, for a reason. But even this is not the right way to do it. Right? This, this, this should never have been done this way in the first place. So what it's doing is it's conflating rest with user presentation. Right. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, I've seen, you know, breaking things down with the presenter frame or presenter pattern or you know, there, there are a number of ways to, um, to simplify this. But we've got to pay attention to the way that the initial user approaches Rails, right? This is the feeling that I used to have, right? But now I take this, these problems and then I stack them on, to on top of other problems that are actually central to Rails, right? Do you remember how we used to parse parameters? 
I can tell a user, okay, this is a pattern. This is where to find the pattern. It's in routes. Did you encounter the pattern? You scan down. When you see the match, you, you use this pattern to, to map the route, right? So this would actually argue in favor sometimes of the controller action ID, having to type all that stuff out. Being explicit had, had a definite um, a definite plus um, depending on the beholder, right? Now the routing rules are a little bit more polluted. I shouldn't say polluted because that's, that's um, a loaded word. I should say they're more complicated. They're more powerful, but with the additional power comes um, you know, more responsibility. So that means that, that um, now I have to walk through the existing routes and what am I looking for? A lot of the named routes and what are the named routes? We couldn't even agree on how many named routes there were, right? It's pretty complicated, right? So I take a new user, and, and this was one of the issues that we went back and forth with um, when we were trying to introduce Rails to a new pro programmer. It's not an easy thing. Um, here, and the dangerous thing is that the new paradigm breaks the old paradigm. A good example. HTTP, my application, users, login. If I have a map resources users, that breaks. What's that going to try to do? It's going to do a get. It's going to do a show on a user with the ID of login. Right? Um, and I don't know what the answer is. I'll suggest, um, suggest one possibility a little bit later. But I do know that this is breaking the approachability of Rails. And how many of you have, have um, dealt with, um, with somebody that's bringing an old application up to the new model? And how did that go? It, it, it's tough. And I mean, it's tough for me. We've got, we've got an old application that we want to leave out there, and we want to um, basically let it grow or die, right? The user base is going to grow. That's our model. We take a social pro problem. We try to solve it in a way that's going to make us money. And if it doesn't live, that's great. If it lives, then that's great too. But um, you know, there's, there's another one of these dichotomies, and that's between backward compatibility and um, keeping the language fresh and new. And I've been a loud proponent of breaking backward compatibility. But there is an associated cost, and that's one of them. Punchline here. I'll get you in a second. Okay. So it's the eye of the beholder, right? This fluffy little clown doesn't look like a fluffy little clown to a beginner. Right? Anybody ever seen that movie, by the way? With the popcorn guns and the, the, client, the clowns that will just eat you? Uh, it's it's um, pretty bizarre, pretty sick. So we had a question over here, comment? Backward compatibility realm, there's a cost of being backward compatible too, right? I mean, if, if anybody's ever done Java and they have to deal with date time, they know that, like, you know, when they deprecate, it stays there for whatever since 97. I'm the original. I'm the original. I mean, I, I, I'm always arguing to break backward compatibility. I'm, I'm just saying that there is an associated cost. Right. And sometimes, so, so I guess the reason that I'm mentioning this is that one of the questions I asked at the very beginning was, who do you aspire to be? And there are a lot of Mavericks in, in this room. In fact, you know, we have one of the original Mavericks and Dave Thomas that basically drug an industry kicking and screaming and into, into a beautiful language. And, and Dave is better at this than most people are. A lot of Mavericks tend to sell hard. And when we sell hard, we overstate the benefits and we undersell the cost. And again, I'm one of the originals in that space. And you know, as being a, a Rails customer, stepping back from the consulting world and being a Rails customer for a little while um, has changed my perspective a little bit. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, if there's, a, if there's a, a question between breaking backwards compatibility and polluting the language, you break backwards compatibility. And you walk and don't run, right? But um, we're pretty aggressive in this community. And I'm not sure where the line is, right? OK, so the next, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, is rest for the rest of us, not, not for newbies, right? 
There are a lot of paths that I introduced in this code. First, if I were to run the, the, the typical RCUF tool on this, how many paths would I, had to, would I have to cover, really? How many tests would I have to build, or how many HTTP requests would I have to make to cover everything I need to in this? Really two, right? Well, to, to get 100% coverage. That's not to test everything, right? <laughs> That's to get me to 100% coverage. I need to get two, right? I know that if I make, if I make, that, if I make this succeed, then it's at least going to execute the front half of this, even if it's XML, right? It's not going to touch the block. Right. So that's, that's the point, right? There's one, two, three, four. There are five paths in here, right? So the RESTful resources are powerful, but they're not cheap. There are built-in costs all over the place. Powerful, but not cheap. So, you know, use it when, when you need it. And don't use it when you don't. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit scary to me that, um, you know, that the, that the typical, that the typical um, model of, of REST breaks so many of the old things that are, that are actually attractive for a user. Yeah, Lance. Yeah, yeah. But so much of, of what we see um, has not just the, the I mean, it, it's, it's, all, it's all encapsulated, right? It, it has the format stuff in there, the map resources in there. And both of those things are very problematic for users, right? It just it introduces a whole, um, a whole new learning curve very early in the process. And it breaks the old model, right? So, so that when I'm trying to get the mechanics of Rails down, I also have to get this nuance of how to, con how to design um, a web application that's, that's just CRUD-based resources. And that's very difficult. Uh, you know, just one example. How do you do um, RESTful authentication? Well, we know one model. One model is that to create a new, um, or to, to log in, you know, I call um, sessions slash new. <laughs> But what we really want is a login method on user, but REST says I can't do that. So uh, I don't do that, right? So you know, maybe users, maybe accounts shouldn't be a RESTful thing, right? Maybe that doesn't fit the paradigm. Maybe that login method belongs where we want to park it in the first place. So anyway, um, here's, some, here's um, a mapping that I often use with routes. Um, that allows um, a little bit more clarity, if you will. So I have objects, for example, um, in, in the nonprofit world, I have nonprofits, plural, um, and that works with lists and, and creates, and I have nonprofit singular, and that works with um, beautiful URLs. Yeah? Okay, so this is the part where I'm getting a little confused. Yeah. So you're saying that this is what you use in your applications, the ones that you actually you know, produce and yeah. in production. Why do you care whether or not somebody who is unfamiliar with I um, understand the argument that you shouldn't put like the format stuff inside of the scaffolding. Yeah. That's exactly what a, a new person in Ruby or Rails yeah. is going to get introduced to. But why would you change the way that you write applications that you're going to deploy to production and that you're going to work on to go to, to work with the most common denominator of Ruby code? Um, and I'm, I'm arguing that, that precisely that that's, that that's what you, you, um, you should do, right? You should, you should write your code for your business requirements. That's, that's all I'm saying here. It's the eye of the beholder, right? If, if I've got, if I'm, um, if I want to build, if I want to build a RESTful system, the REST stuff is going to be beautiful to me, right? If I have anything that I have to enable for a third party API, um, you know, I'm all over it. If I don't need it, I don't use it. And um, we ought to all think that way. But yeah, I completely agree with you. Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit and um, get a little more controversial, get myself in a little more trouble. Um, talk about testing. And the, of course, the, the big controversy that everybody is talking about now 
is fixtures, right? How many say fixtures are evil? Not evil? It depends, right? <laughs> so I don't have to go after uh, go through this part of the talk, right? Um, we're starting to. This is starting to be an area of dogma, much like we saw with the early adoption of the rest stuff, right? Fixtures were evil. Never code that way. But there are some advantages to um, the original um, development of fixtures, right? They're dry. They're very simple. They're very quick to understand. When I've got a user, I say this this YML file um, maps right onto fields in the database, right? Um, there's some danger. Can you guys in the back read this? This sign says seven people have drowned here, right? You can't see it very well because it's with an underwater camera. It's, it's taken with an underwater camera because we're about to get in our wetsuits and run down this river. And this guy has not read the sign yet, right? So we drive all night. He stumbles out of the car, leans on the sign. He starts yawning. And the sign that he's leaning on is saying, Caution, seven people have drowned here, right? <laughs> That's a pretty good metaphor for fixtures, right? You stumble into this thing. You know, you, you build these fixtures in YML for relational databases. And there's that word, right, relational. And there are a whole lot of relationships intertwined in the data. And you find yourself tying test cases together that you don't want to tie together, right? Did I sum it up pretty well? How many people have blown up bad with fixtures? And I'm definitely in that camp. Right? So one of the big things, one of the big problems is that, is that data, especially relational data with complicated models, can tie your tests together in um, pretty surprising ways, right? And when you get to that point, creating a new test is tough. How many of you have worked with fixtures where, where um, somebody was doing a quick and dirty job and they verified an ad by counting all the rows in the fixture? Oh man, that's awful, right? Because then you get you 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 make one change somewhere, and then somewhere else it says, up oh, five expected four, right? Yeah. I was just say, is that a fault of the picture or a fault of a stupid test, though? That's a stupid test, right? But one of the things I'll talk about is that um, if you allow a lot of fingers into a code base, that kind of thing can happen pretty easily, right? So. One of the things that, um, one of the breakthroughs for a lot of people when they start thinking about fixtures is that maybe drying up the test cases is the wrong thing to do. If you're trying to isolate things, which is the important thing about the test case, you want to be on an island. And by definition, islands are not dry, right? You have to build in all of the knowledge into the test case. You have to encapsulate the test case, right? So um, there are a lot of ways to get to the island. One is through the, um, the mock objects frameworks. Um, is Jim Warwick here? Probably in the other room. But, um, but I talked about, do you value beauty in code? Um, gosh, FlexMock is beautiful software. It lets you express in an English sentence um, how you want your dependencies to, um, to, to be managed in your test cases. Um, you can also use frameworks to create the, the, um, the objects instead and get you to the island state. Um, there are a number of, of different frameworks or frameworks or APIs or even helper methods that you can use to create your data. So the unconventional wisdom at first seems to be don't use fixtures like ever, right? Because there are some downsides. But there are some downsides to the fixture-less approach, right? The first one is that we're increasing the setup cost for early tests. And sometimes you can absorb that, and sometimes you just can't, right? You're also, one of the things that I think is, is um, underrated in, um, in Rails testing circles is that we are building on a framework that builds dynamic behavior into the model objects based on the contents of the database. And if you take the database out of the picture often enough, some, something down the line is going to break. Right? There's, no mis there's no substitute for enough tests with the databases behind you. So 
the big question here is who is the beholder, right? If I have a team that, that has heavy dependencies, it has a big database or, or, or even a complex database, if there are just 50 tables but they're heavily intertwined, that's a complicated model. I'm going to look at the fixture list alternatives. If I have a very large team or if I have a team where I'm not paying the developers very well so I have a lot of turnover, that's going to drive me toward the fixture list alternatives. This is the safe approach. But if I have a small team with small simple models and they've been through, they're actually experienced, so they've been through the fixture pain before, I feel pretty safe with a fixtures based approach. I've started three projects this year. Two were started with fixtures, one was started without. And the one without is gonna have more coders in the base, they're gonna be less experienced, and the models are much, much more complex. And we, we feel confident that we're gonna build a maintainable set of, of test cases. We feel confident that if we built it the other, another way, then, um, then we'd be in trouble. And the other approach is very small teams, small number of tables, and we do small things to mitigate the damage that a fixture-based approach could work. One of them is when the, when the number of fixtures grows beyond four, we start to um, look at the design of our, we, we start to look at that as a code smell. And often we'll be using um, another approach to help us isolate. The next thing that we do is when we're dealing with edge cases, we don't try to use fixture data. We try to load a, a fixture and modify that fixture, or we try to create a, um, a, a piece of data from scratch. We also use mocks often to increase our isolation. So when we've got one contained area of the system and another contained area of the system, we try not to cross those boundaries in the unit test. We save that for the functional integration test, usually the integration test. And then don't count or don't do roll-ups on fixture data. They make your test cases brittle um, and dangerous, right? The other thing that I don't see often in this community, but, but we really should see, is people that use fixtures should label them really, really well. Probably most of you are starting to label your test cases that way. Do you guys like long test names? I really like, I mean, test should render update if blah, 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 blah. You know, you know I, I can use the whole length of, of, the, um, of the screen on one test name. I name the, um, the fixture data the same way, especially if there's something that I don't want changed for a particular reason. Okay, so the quick answer is, again, it depends. <laughs> it's kind of a wishy-washy talk, right? The answer is always, it depends. Um, so quick hitters. I think that we need to consider the purpose of the software that we're building. That, um, so when we built the, the first web application with, with Wellgood, we, we thought that we would actually blast the user with features, right? <laughs> you, can, you can buy a gift, you can associate a gift card with it, you can um, build a wish list of things that you want, you can build a memorial or a wedding registry, we have information from our advisors, we had um, news feeds from RSS, we had literally 17 major features that took more than a man month or more to implement, right? That's a lot of features. And then we said when a nonprofit enters new data, we're gonna have a state machine behind that so that we can understand, we can make sure that if somebody um, that uploaded a pro-choice gift, somebody else couldn't, uh, or was a pro-choice nonprofit, a pro-life nonprofit couldn't um, go grab that nonprofit up um, site and, and, and basically um, vandalize it. Um, when we built Class Wish, we took the opposite approach. This thing is about teachers building wish lists and parents and, and friends making donations, and that's it. And everything is simple. And now, if we are stalled for a business reason, we if, 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 we, if there aren't any features that we can be building on the backlog, we're playing the Xbox. I mean, the best, the worst thing in the world is an idle programmer that's making his own work, right? That's an expensive thing. Second thing is money. We've talked about this one. We need, we, 
need more value on the economics of our decisions in the programming community. We don't consider the cost, the bottom line cost of the business um, when, when we make major decisions. Um, I know that I don't enough and I need to do a better job with that. Um, I think that stories are incredibly important in your code. When your code stops talking to you, when you can't see the story from just scanning the code, that's a dangerous thing. Stories are also important across developers. We need to be able to say, hey, this didn't work. We need to be able to share our war stories and we need to make time for that to happen. We need to um, spend time together outside of the context of, of development. Um, and stories are important in conferences like this one too. We need to be able to hear what works for people and what breaks. We need to get different opinions out there. This is how a community um, really thrives. The last thing that I'd like to leave you with is a challenge, and this is completely unrelated to the talk. The challenge is threefold. The first one is to, is that, is the idea that, that we are fortunate to be in a great industry and a great time in that industry with Ruby. We live in a great place, and, and that great, you know, the great region is in a great country. You know, we're fortunate. Take a programmer, find a programmer that doesn't know what you know and, and help them learn. Whether that's a mentoring relationship, whether you're writing, find a way to take what you know and give it to somebody else. The second piece of that challenge is this whole community is basically built on people giving, right? On people giving away um, free software and services. But it's a community, so find a way to give back to the community. The third thing is probably the hardest challenge of all. Try to find a way to use your skills to change the world. And that's all I've got to say. So questions and comments. Yeah. It, it struck me that uh, both of the examples you showed, both from the, from the uh, RESTful content handling and more fixtures, that they're, say that they're playing over questions about cohesion and coupling in that order. Mm -hmm kind of funny that we're back on the same old, same old. It's, right. Is it waking up in the Rails? Like, is it finally like Rails is getting complex enough or the apps are getting complex enough that we're saying, hey, you know what? Like, OO design, maybe maybe it actually does. Maybe design principles make sense here. Yeah, uh, could be. Uh, I guess hanging out in the Rails community, I often actually sometimes hear people sort of poo-poo <coughs> design practices and design principles as if it wasn't, they weren't really in play. Well, you know, um, the, the, rest, uh, the Rails software is opinionated software, and a lot of the opinions are great, and that's why we're sitting here, right? Um, you know, we, we basically broke some, some hard conventional wisdom with, um, with the convention over configuration. Everything was XML configuration until this point. Um, we said that worry, another piece of conventional wisdom was that we need to be worrying about scalability when scalability matters, not right out of the gate, right? So, you know, if there are a couple of... of um, of decisions that are, you know, maybe borderline, maybe, maybe suboptimal. Um, maybe they're just controversial decisions um, for areas that are hard to get right. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to give a pass. I think but, it, was, it was really great is, you know, the Rails communities tend, tended to, or Rails, the framework, tended to address accidental complexity in existing web frameworks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it seems to be driving so, so far on this, on this tack that it's creating accidental simplicity and another problem, uh, another set of problems going on. Could be, could be. We had another comment over here. Okay, I have a, um, yeah. So I have a, a couple comments. So one, um, I, I'm a newbie. So I came in, I just started, I bought some books on Ruby, some books on Rails. I figured I'm gonna start learning it. Just as I start learning it, everything switched to 3.0, 2.1. None of, a lot of the stuff in the books just don't work anymore, right? Tutorials break, things like that. My book broke, man. I got all kinds of hate mail. Yeah. So, you know, talking about, like, you know, talking about, you know, Lance and what we work on. Yeah, it's from a, from a, going to the RESTful, RESTful I think is really cool. I don't understand it. I mean, I understand what RESTfulness is, but I don't understand the code behind it, what it's really doing. Right. So, yeah, so as a newbie, yeah, I'm confused a second. I don't know where to start. So that takes me to the second one where you're, you have your challenges. You know, and, and find a newbie. So I, I'm here in the Austin area. If anybody's looking for me, <laughs> there you go. You might get more help than you bargained for. Yeah, yeah Lance. I, I think that your builder.
Okay, before we get too much further, we'll take some more questions, but um, Dave, was there a question that you really liked today? Uh, a couple. I like Eric Wong. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the one I liked the most was, I don't know your name, but it's the possession of the last one out around here. The, the purple one. Well, here? Yeah. What did I do? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> All right, Scott. <laughs> And there's, there's, you got another one? No, I think the thing is the point is well made, that, you know, we are, to some extent, becoming very lazy because we are having things done for us, and as a result, we're not stopping to think. Was there another question that you liked? Um, yes, I can't remember what it was. I just remember the gentleman who asked it, second from the end in the row of the end there. Uh, excellent. And so, raise your hand. Which? You, sir. Yes. Oh, excellent. Deploying Rails applications. <laughs> What's that? Okay. Another question. Go ahead. Yeah, I own all your books. Dave loves you, man. So really, I wouldn't give this away because So you you pick a question that you really liked. No, I did not same question. There you go. Yeah. Deploying Rails applications. Yeah. Like the system is the scaffolding, not the act. Since the act doesn't teach you anything, the scaffolding was not. This is the way to do it, but this is where to start. Yeah. It was a wonderful place to start. I got something up and running. I could play with it. None of that code has remained. Yeah. There's, there's, there's not debate about it, but that, it is. That's not the original. There's debate about whether that was the original intent. And so I, I don't know which quote I read that said, but put, put it in a good way. Some one group of people thinks that it, it should be the, ex, the example of the correct way to do things. One group thinks that it's the example of how to get started. And because there's a disagreement, it's somewhere in the middle. Well, and it sort of sucks. Right. Even if you get away from the scaffolding, so then I mean, it's kind of one, or at this point, that's a little lower. Especially when Hansen came out with, you know, the whole world is rest. A lot of people, like you read on the on the forums and whatever, have <coughs> not done Rails, but haven't run into it yet. They're going, oh, well, I don't understand. How do I make, my login has to be rest, and I'm not allowed. I saw this a lot of times. I'm not allowed to put another method in my controller. Under the <laughs> right, 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 right. And when you do put another method in, it breaks, right? Because you have the user slash login, which is, why is it trying to show a user named login, right? right. And then your chat box. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about this just two days ago. We were on an app that was a little bit older, but had one map resources login. And that's what it was. You didn't even bring up the thing that gets Right. It's a damn thing plural or singular. And again, I'm not throwing stones. I'm not saying that the restful stuff is crap. I'm saying that there is a cost to the rest. That's it. So um, let me take one more question, and then we'll shut down and, and for dinner. Yeah. It's not a question so much a statement, but maybe it is a question. But I don't understand why we want our logins to be restful. Because uh, rest is supposedly a stateless uh, idea. It's made for web services. Web services don't maintain state like, right. like a login. Right, right, right. Why are we trying to make our login? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and, you know, that's a pretty unnatural design, right? It's session slash new. Yeah. It's like, you know, I'm testing my friends. W2F, question mark, question mark, right? <laughs> I got to take I got to take another question. Uh, yeah. Well, well, I think it's it's a, a horrible effort because if you think about like hear artists talk about it more often, sometimes it's worth it to try to work within constraints. And you can maybe it was an experiment that failed, but sometimes you say everything is going to be rest. Will it work? Will it not? I can see the motivation. I use that plugin and I use it like every that's that's the first one I installed. So I'm not slamming the plugin. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm slamming yeah, and I, I agree with you so that that Right. Or you're trying to get to provide a, a consistent design across your whole application, right? And that's that's a laudable um, 
I do, right? So, but but there is a cost, and that's that's the whole point. Um, okay, guys, thanks a lot. So so um, my question to you: Did did I hit the mark? Is was that an interesting talk? Yes. Thought provoking? Okay. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.